Hello guys and girls and welcome back to Scandinavian Design 101. I'm Sanna. I'm Andreas and as you all know by now we're two Swedes that's very interested in Scandinavian design and modern design. Yeah. And today we're going to talk about the Swedish version of the functionalist movement or funkis as we often say in Sweden. And the style had its big breakthrough in the 1930s and soon became widely popular and is still so today. And however, it's not just about aesthetics, it's also about politics. It is. Mm -hmm. Exciting, huh? <laughs> In the early 20th century, Swedish design and architecture was characterized by traditional and classical styles. At the turn of the century, the national romantic and art nouveau styles totally dominated. This was a nostalgic time when the artists dreamed back to the old days, glorifying tradition and a time when Sweden was, was a great power in Northern Europe. Craftsmanship was highly valued, and local materials like stone and wood was used. These were the styles for the upper class, not the common people. An important building from this time is the Stockholm City Hall, which was finished in 1923. Simultaneously, a style often called Swedish Grace emerged, based on the 18th century neoclassical aesthetics and the European Art Deco movement. It culminated already in 1925 at the Paris exhibition. At the exhibition, a pavilion created by Le Corbusier, Amédée Osenfant and Pierre Chanaré showed completely other tendencies. It consisted of a white two-story modular dwelling unit with open plan, big glass windows, some built-in furniture and a few pieces of mass-produced furniture, very stripped down and without decoration. Mm. This was totally different from the other pavilions that mostly showed expensive one-of-a-kind pieces. With this they wanted to show the pure forms of industrial standardization suitable for mass production. It was highly controversial, not least because it reinvented the meaning of the word furniture. Instead of being decorative items, they were just equipments with a specific purpose in the household. Yeah. But it was not just them who had these modern ideas. In Germany, the Bauhaus school had been active since 1919 and was extremely important for the emerging modernist movement. Yes. And now back to Sweden. Um, the big breakthrough for the functionalist movement was an exhibition arranged in Stockholm in 1930. And this event had a huge impact on how the modern Sweden would come to be designed. From one uh, year to another, the country's architects totally shifted aesthetics. Mm. Uh, that cannot at least be seen in the Stockholm architecture, where neoclassical homes were built until 1929. But in 1930, functionalist buildings suddenly dominated totally. And in a short time in the transition, some of the square modern buildings still got some classical ornamentations, of course. Um, the Stockholm exhibition had its grand opening in May of 1930. And before it was closed in September the same year, more than 4 million people had visited. And this is an extremely... It's an extremely large number of people because Sweden at the time had only about 5 million citizens. <laughs> so that's sick actually. It is.
The exhibition was arranged by the city of Stockholm in collaboration with the Swedish Society of Crafts and Design, Svenska Slöjtföreningen. This organization wanted to show the Swedish people the modern design that was growing in countries like Germany and France. Le Corbusier was at first commissioned to be the exhibition's main architect, but this did not happen and he was replaced by the Swedish architect Gunnar Asplund. But by choosing Le Corbusier, it was clear what kind of direction the exhibition wanted to take. It was indeed intended to be the end of the classical aesthetics in Sweden. Yeah. The exhibition was divided in two parts. One part was building design and the other part showed arts and crafts. The latter showed a mixture of modern pieces and more traditional Swedish craftsmanship. But at the building exhibition, all traces of the old styles were totally gone. The country's young architects propagated for a new way of living. The buildings were much inspired by international predecessors, just like Le Corbusier, with the stripped-down minimalist shapes furnished with only the most important. Much of the furniture was made by the architects themselves in an effort to create interiors suitable mm. for their hyper-modern houses. <laughs> the press surrounding the exhibition was... Mostly positive, but not only no, positive. No. Uh, many describe the style with words like sterile, fake, and indifferent. <laughs> okay, yeah. But the critics couldn't stop the revolution, and no. for the rest of the century, these ideals would come to affect the whole Swedish society. Absolutely. And um, the functionalist idea suited uh, Sweden's leading uh, social democratic party very well. And uh, since Sweden held its first democratic election in 1921, the Social Democratic Party had been the dominating political player. And in 1928, Per Albin Hansson, who would later become prime minister in Sweden, introduced the word folkhemmet in Swedish politics. And the word means something like the people's home, and refers to a society organized to take care of all people, no matter of heritage or wealth. And the key word was collaboration. And like in the Manifest of the Modernists, the society was considered to be a complex system whose parts should uh, work together to promote solidarity and stability. Conflicts was to be avoided, negotiations replaced strikes, and change was to be achieved by discussion, the Swedish way. In this society, the citizens should live in houses such as them shown at the exhibition in Stockholm. The old aesthetics was made for the upper class, the functionalist style was for all people. And inspired by the Bauhaus, the the politicians in Sweden wanted to use the architects as a mean to change the whole society to a better and more equal place. And in 1932, Per Albin Hansson became prime minister. And soon after the election, he made a quite surprising decision to move to a small terraced house being built in a Stockholm suburb. And the prime minister's house was one of totally 94 equal cube-shaped homes with off-white plaster facade. And not the luxurious home, but the home suitable for a prime minister wanting to be one with the people. And that was the idea, of course. (laughs) And the modern buildings uh, were a symbol for the modern and equal society Per Albin Hansson wanted to create. When it comes to Swedish furniture design, the functionalist ideas wasn't as apparent as in the architecture. Best known is perhaps Bruno Mattsson, who was highly influenced by the Bauhaus school and the ideas by Le Corbusier, Mm -hmm. which we mentioned them a lot. Yeah. (laughs) He visited the Stockholm exhibition and got inspired by what he saw, and soon he created his own interpretations of the tubular, tubular, that's a hard word, tubular, <laughs> tubular steel furniture, but in his version, made from bentwood. Bruno Mattsson was probably the most influential functionalist furniture designer in Sweden, but we already done a video about him, yeah. so if you want to know more, please go check that out. And for how long did the functionalist ideas dominate the Swedish design scene? Well, it depends on what we mean with functionalism. Some historians tend to focus on the objects that were designed with function as the main goal, while other historians argue that functionalism is all about the politics. It's therefore hard to say when the functionalist era ended 
but it's a fact that the aesthetics changed in the late 30s. Mm. In architecture, neo-realism took over, and even though some functionalist ideas were kept, flat roofs and white plaster facades was no longer a thing. No, and when it comes to crafts, the pure functionalist shapes inspired by international architects lost its fo- foothold uh, and the more traditional designers like uh, Karl Malmsten started to play a bigger part. At the Stockholm exhibition, the conflict between functionalists and traditionalists was obvious, but during the 30s, the difference slowly grew smaller, and in the late 30s, Malmsten exhibited together with the functionalists. Uh, And while his furniture tended to get a bit more modernist, uh, the functionalist furniture tended to become a bit less square and sterile. And year by year, the two emerged into the thing we today call Swedish design. And this was our introduction uh, to uh, Funkis. Funkis. Um, Hope you learned something new today. And if you liked the video, please click thumbs up. Please, and (laughs) And, subscribe. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) and uh, if you want to learn more, you should follow us on Instagram. We are called uh, Scandinavian Design 101, and we have daily posts about design. Thank you for watching. Yeah, thanks.